Today is the day we acknowledge the baptism of Jesus. And when we look at our first lesson, I want you to consider people you've known who said something that was truer than they realized. In other words, something that had deeper meaning than they thought. So it is with many of the Old Testament prophecies. When we look at the book of Isaiah, we see that there is a section of this book where different passages known as the servant songs are written. And those servant songs describe for people who were in exile in Babylon how God, who had not forgotten them, was going to send someone to rescue them. Little did Isaiah realize that in a broader context, we now, from our perspective in history, realize that Isaiah was talking about Jesus, who was God's servant. And we find that in our gospel lesson this morning and at various places throughout the gospel, how Jesus chose to be God's servant and be obedient to his will. We hear first from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Here ends the first lesson. Remember when you were a kid and you inquired of your parents where the noise and light came from as you had to endure a thunder and lightning storm? I remember being told it was the angels bowling in heaven. <laughs> Typical Lutheran, huh? Hmm. Gotta have you bowling league. <laughs> and the light flashes were when the angels got strikes. So it is in our psalm for today. We hear about the thunder and the lightning. The psalmist describes for us a fierce thunderstorm while he's worshiping in the temple. Lightning flashes, thunder crashes, and rain pours down with such power that they can be likened only to the voice and majestic power and glory of God. The wind blows so strongly that it bends the mighty cedars in Lebanon. If you recall earlier this week, one of those big trees up north, the one with the tunnel through which cars had driven for many years, mm -hmm. people can walk through that tunnel no more. For with the rain and the soft soil, the tree fell over. Turn with me please to page 228 in the hymnals. <coughs> and we'll read Psalm 29, 
together in unison. Psalm 29, page 228. Ascribe to the Lord, you gods. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Mount Hermon like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord splits the flames of fire, but the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kaddish. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees writhe and strips the forest bare. And in the temple of the Lord all are crying glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. The Lord shall give strength to his people. The Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. This morning we have one of our great duh moments of scripture where one of our biblical characters is given a revelation from God that totally reorients his perspective. Peter was a Jew and the Messiah was promised to the Jews. And Peter was like many of the people of his day where he believed the Messiah was exclusively for the Jews. Kind of like Lutherans, you know? We have all the truth. We know because we took a vote. <laughs> and we decided we have all the truth. And if anybody else wants the truth, they need to become Lutheran. <laughs> Doesn't quite work that way. The Jewish faith, like other religions in the world, had very strict dietary codes. Foods were considered clean or unclean. And in our second lesson for today, Peter is given a revelation where God presents to him a whole canopy full of foods of an unclean character. And he's told, get up, prepare a meal from these foods, and eat. Peter's response is that of revulsion. I can't eat these foods. It's unclean. And there's the marvelous response, how can anything that comes from God be unclean? Mm -hmm. There's a broader application to that. Because at the same time Peter was having this vision, a Roman centurion named Cornelius was given a message from God to seek out Peter and to learn about the gospel of Jesus. And so they meet, and while they're talking, Cornelius becomes a Christian, and God blesses them with the Holy Spirit. I find application for us in our society today, where we look at people and we identify something in their lifestyle, or their gender, or their race, and it leads us to say, we're clean, you're not. We've got the truth, you don't. Whack! That's usually when we get a smack in the back of the head from God <laughs> that says, I created all people, <coughs> and they're all my children, so how can anyone be unclean. Amen. Now we need to distinguish between sinful behavior and who we are as God's children. From the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. <laughs> then Peter began to speak, Cornelius and his household. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who reveres him and does what is right is acceptable to him. 
You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. Not to all people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in his name receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Here ends our second lesson. The baptism of Jesus occurs in several of the Gospels, but curiously, Matthew presents John's protest. We have word from the other Gospels about how John was down by the River Jordan baptizing people as a sign of their repentance. John had alerted them that there was one coming after him, greater than he who would baptize with the Holy Spirit. He pointed to Jesus one day and said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then one morning, Jesus appears by the riverside and asks to be baptized. <clears throat> now, this story confuses a lot of people. John's purpose in baptism, like many others of his time, was a baptism of repentance. You came, you indicated your sorrow for sin by being baptized. Understandably, John is confused when the sinless one comes to him. And we might well ask the question, if Jesus was without sin, why was he baptized? The answer is not because he needed forgiveness, but because he was demonstrating his obedience to the will of God. We rise from the good news of the gospel. This is the gospel according to Matthew, the third chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated and we'll sing the next hymn.